This is To Live Unrelenting, the podcast, episode number seven. When I first joined the Mount Hope Young Adults team and became a leader there, there were some things that were expected of me. I was expected to be growing in my own spiritual life, becoming a better leader of myself, but also I was expected to disciple young men. I was expected to be able to answer questions about how to live their lives well, how to be how to grow closer with the Lord, but also just how to do life in general. I need to be able to answer questions like how to pay taxes, how to ask a girl out on a date, ask the real tough questions that young men have, whatever they may be. And I don't always answer them well. I'm not expected to have all of the answers, but I am expected to have good control of my life so that I can impart that same control onto other young men. Today, I'm really, really proud and really honored to be able to have on the podcast a young man who I've walked out of a really dark place. I've helped him grow with alongside the Lord, but truly nothing that I did. All I did was talk to him, pray with him. That's all I did. Everything else that has happened to turn this young man's life around was entirely his own, as well as the hand of the Lord upon him. And um, this particular young man, whenever I speak to him and I hear how well he's doing, how far he's come from where he once was, I can't help but feel something that I would assume is fatherly pride, which is a little bit weird because he's only a year younger than me. But regardless, I am really proud of this young man. One of the things that Paul would say often to uh, the people that he wrote to, the churches that he built up was, whenever you come to mind, I thank God for your faithfulness. I thank God for your great love. I thank God for you. And every time this young man comes to mind, I thank God for him. Because I love him so much. And so I am very proud to present to you my good friend and a young man that I have mentored for a few short years, Peter Kaiser. Peter, thank you so much for coming on. I uh, thank you for having me, Mr. Aaron. <laughs> You always call me Mr. Aaron or Mr. Begow Mr. Begowan, which I think is funny. <laughs> yeah, I don't even remember how it started, honestly. But your uh, your reaction to being called Mr. Begowan is always entertaining to me. So just it is it's continued. That's true, partially because literally nobody except you calls me Mr. Begowan. <laughs> that is part of it. Oh man, Peter. How old are you, and what do you currently do? So, at the moment, I am 20, going into 21 in the near future. Um, I do electrical engineering. I just started doing that full-time. I graduated from an apprentice position, and that is, that's the majority of what I do right now is uh, just my job. Yeah, for a little context, you... You literally just basically live your job because you travel around the country doing these electrical jobs in various places. So you kind of have to be a a bit of a, a nomad, if you will. Yeah, to an extent. I don't really have a permanent address, which keeps keeps taxes fun. <laughs> but um, <laughs> for the for the most part. We have sites, and we'll be on a site for sometimes. I've had sites where I've been on for four days. I've had sites where I'm I'm currently embedded in Connecticut for the next nine months. Nice. So I, I have a little bit of stability at the moment, but um, quite often that is not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's good because what did you do uh, before you got this apprentice? Well, before you got the apprenticeship, what did you do before that? So I, I bounced around a whole bunch of 
different places. I spent two years kind of, or, or about a year and a half, mostly wandering and uh, not really having much of a direction in life. So I worked at an auto body shop. I worked at a sawmill. I did landscaping. Um, I worked at, I did a job that was related to used car lots for a little bit too. Mm-hmm. So I'd been a kind of a, I kind of wandered a whole bunch of different places during that time. Yeah. But now you've got yourself a career, a direction, good skill set that you can use for the rest of your life. Yes. And another key factor of that is um, the company I am working at is allowing me to come in without the degree and essentially allowing me to gain the experience on the job versus uh, having to have that proven with a have that proven the with a four year degree. Yeah, that's really good. That is really, really good. Uh, yeah. so Peter, how did you initially come to follow Jesus? So I have, uh, my initial is I grew up in a godly household with, uh, my mom, dad, younger brother and older sister, um, who were all Christians. Um, obviously over time I did end up straying away from that for a little bit. But my initial, I, I had that initial growing up in the church. So you grew up in a Christian household. Um, what is it that initially caused you to kind of stray off? I would say not necessarily being happy where I was at. And then slowly, particularly, I so I moved out at 18 and um, started exploring and then that's that's probably the point where i really i started ch- changing from having god be a key factor in my life to sort of replacing that with uh drugs to an extent and different different uh, just all kinds of bad influences mm-hmm. other than um other than looking to christ during that time so when life started getting hard i kind of flaked away yeah. So you you really started to drift off when you were 18. Like how how long would you say cuz you moved out at your 18th birthday or what does that look like? Right, and I guess there was precursors to that um even beforehand just having to go out and do silly things when I was even 16, but 18 was really like I was allowed to be set out onto the world. Mm-hmm. I pretty much I moved out um, almost after my 18th birthday and had this now newfound because my dad's always uh, been there for me. I've like, been a guy, been a good guidance to me. I haven't always listened to him, but having moved out and not even having that uh, piece of guidance left, yeah, um, have to start making decisions on my own. Uh, definitely. So there were some precursors, but I'd say 18 was probably the uh, the big, big turning point for me. Okay. But what is what does the story look like from like, you turn 18, did you immediately move out? I mean, yeah, yeah. I turned 18, and at that point, I'd already like started doing. I'd already started doing silly things like experimenting with getting high, or I'd been vaping for. A while at that point mm-hmm. so i'd already uh but then they kind of became more more consistent where and i didn't have to worry about hiding things at that point um okay so there wasn't just like i moved out at 18 and then you know six down, months down the line something happened but it was just i had already been messing around i moved out and it kind of just gradually went up from there my use of the vaping and the nicotine and the marijuana and all that yeah like all of a sudden i didn't have to like cover my trail i had my own space where my uh, no one that i like my 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 father or somebody else like that would not have uh, been in so all of a sudden i could pretty much it was more of a factor of how much uh money i had at the moment not um not where i could hide something okay 
And so, so, but it was gradual. It was gradual. It wasn't like all of a sudden overnight. I uh, just went out and got everything. It was more so. It was, it was a slow flow of uh, building up to that. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your life. Like, I know that at 19, 19 is when we started to, to talk. Because for a little bit of context, Peter and I went to the same church for a little while. And he and I were in youth group together. Uh, and I graduated. And around the time that I graduated, he and I kind of stopped talking to each other. Um, just for that that brief period. But there was a period of time where Peter came back and contacted me. So what what brings you to that moment of wanting to talk to me about how your life is going? Um, I, I moved out from my dad's house in North Carolina. I moved just down the road and um, started having some some freedom there and then stayed down there for a couple of months and then I moved up to Michigan before Christmas of that year and started working at a sawmill, worked, lived at my grandparents for a little bit. And, um, obviously going back to having, um, them having a authority figure around being my grandma or my grandfather. Um, I didn't stay there very long. We had some friction and they were, starting to realize that what I had been doing and working at the sawmill, we had regular access to all of that. So I moved in with somebody from the sawmill and, uh, he was, de- he definitely liked smoking a lot. Mm-hmm. So we'd, uh, we do that. We'd go, we'd go to work on the, on the way to work during work on the way home from work. Um, and I did that for maybe six months or so, and then was up in Michigan still and went up north for a bit, did some work for my uncle, and he wasn't ever there, so I was pretty much allowed, I had free reign for the most part. And then came back to Grand Ledge and got apartment there and or no i came back to portland came back to portland and yeah that and that's about about where um i started working at the auto body shop and i came back to portland and rented these people's basement for a little bit and um continued and had, had about the same there was just random random people living there that would come and go and not about the about the same crowd as the sawmill, mm-hmm. and uh, that's about when I that was about like the first you the first time that I I think I'm trying to remember how we first reached back out to each other because I know we I set up that meeting with you that one morning in like January. Yeah, if I recall, like we spoke to each other sometimes over Discord when we were playing games, but. You reached out to me over Snapchat back when I still had that. Um, And that would have been January of, I want to say, 2021. Yeah, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And I don't even necessarily remember how we got on it. But at some point, it came up that I was... At that point, I was starting to realize, like, um, the failures of that lifestyle on many many levels i was starting to realize just how how that is not sustainable long term and uh you were like one of the one of the only people i reached out to Mm -hmm. what are some of those unsustainabilities like you have a job you're you have food um what is it about the life that you didn't like about your life you didn't like yeah um and that's a good point because it didn't ever really get to the point where it affected like my job or it it did affect like it didn't I wasn't performing as good as I could be 
but I was doing I was doing enough that like I didn't stand out. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just slowly wears wears away. You aren't you can't maintain a good relationship with most people, or you can maintain relationships, but just not good ones. And same thing with like a job, you're not doing it as well as you could be. You can you're kind of uh, doing half of what you could be. And you'll talk to people that will say that um there it's just a extra just an extra stimulant and it's fine and at least for me personally, I absolutely in the long term it was uh, even affecting those. But the really big one is fundamentally you're covering up a hurt. Mm-hmm. You're covering it, it's a spiritual problem that you're uh, trying it's a hole that you're trying to fill emotionally and spiritually and i would say that was the really big one and you can you can only do it for so long before you start going farther down and i was i was absolutely realizing that that like the the next steps for me were not going to be good because i had never i never went any farther than uh nicotine or thc Mm-hmm. The next steps after that were going to start being devastating to those other areas of my life as well. Yeah. And so, during that time, you had a couple uh, a couple failed romantic relationships, if I remember correctly. That was, yes, that was another big one. Is when uh one one failed, and um when I realized just how much um, that stuff had affected that, that I'd lost, um, lost that relationship directly. Be- and I don't want to necessarily shift blame. blame. <laughs> there was still plenty on my part. But um, th- that you can't, you, that's another key one is you just can't have a sustainable relationship when you're doing that. Mm-hmm. Particularly when you're trying to hide that the entire time from that other person yeah absolutely trying to keep a hidden life it's no it's no way to live yeah it always ends up shining through eventually Mm -hmm. so basically what you're telling me is you have a lot of pain that you're trying to hide through the drug use uh and it's starting to affect your ability to work it's starting to affect your ability to maintain relationships um what's What's the straw that broke the camel's back and ended up having you contact me? Partly, partly because of that uh, relationship ending, for sure. Um, that definitely, because I had ended about a, um, early, early December. And that's when I started realizing how much farther down I was going. I never really drank much before and now all of a sudden I was starting to drink a lot more than I had been I was starting to live much more dangerous I I was really starting to realize uh, the realization that um, there was no this was good this was only going downhill had really hit me at that point the realization of just how unsustainable um, this lifestyle was had was really starting to fully hit me because up until that point I'd still been able to scrape by on everything um so at that point all of that was kind of a, a cumulative at one and, and again it wasn't all it wasn't like necessarily just I didn't really have like one of those or yeah I really didn't have like a sudden singular moment it was just kind of a slow a couple of span of a couple of days where I was really starting to realize and um, also just generally looking around at other people, just general knowledge collecting from looking at other people's lives that um, had not made that choice, that had continued going down and where they'd ended up now. Because mm-hmm. that's another one is absolutely, there's always another another rock bottom to hit. Your rock bottom is some 
some sometimes much better than another person's rock bottom, or very quite often, or a lot better than somebody else's. Yeah. So I'd kind of started that had all become very apparent to me at that point, and I was realizing that uh, some I, my life needed to change at that point. Mm-hmm. And that's really where. I'd reached out to you. I started, I hadn't really brought any of this up to my dad either at this point. He, he later mentioned that he kind of knew a little bit, but I hadn't brought it up to him and he hadn't pushed, but I just kind of relayed to him at that point that I was unhappy Mm -hmm. and he helped push me in that direction of, um, Get, in, get involved in a church again. And then, particularly after you and I talked for the first time, um, that really, that's what really helped uh, start setting setting that in motion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So somewhere around the January time, you contact me, we set up a date, we go out to... Uh to Starbucks on the corner of Saginaw and Canal. Mm-hmm. And we sit down. Um, and you tell me about some of the things that are going on in your life. You tell me... From my, from my end of the deal, you come in and... I mean, I really, I really hate to say this because I love you so much, but you, you walked in and I was like... You know, he was always a a bit of an awkward kid, but I've never seen him look so sad. And you just had a really hard time looking me in the eye, which you'd never had a problem with before. Um, So that's like what I'm thinking when you sit down across from me and we just get to talking and you're starting to tell me about all the, the things. And I mean, kudos to you because you had a lot of trust. You really opened up about virtually everything that was going on in your life just on talk number one which doesn't happen very often um yeah i hadn't had anybody and to an extent you kind of got the full full brunt of uh um, all the all the emotions Mm -hmm. which was a little bit yeah it definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hadn't really, and it wasn't even like we were really good friends beforehand either. We were more of acquaintances, if anything out, if anything. True. Um, but honestly, you'd, I felt if comfortable, and you'd you'd started offering good advice, and I felt comfortable opening up and with you. Mm-hmm. Cause we did have at least that little bit of groundwork beforehand. Yeah. And so I, th- I think at the end of the day, my, my, at the end of the day, what I had said to you when you relayed all these things that were going on in your life about the failed relationships and the drinking and the smoking and uh, just the general unhappiness of your life. I think that my, general response was I can give you all kinds of advice but at the end of the day prayer and worship and scripture reading are what's going to get you out of this well and I love uh, there was two really big ones that you I I kept asking for life to get easier Mm -hmm. and you told me that it didn't you had to get harder Mm. and the other really good one that you gave me was that 90 i think i don't know if you said 90 or 95 but the vast majority of my problems that i relayed to you were going to be um were going to be solved by having a through prayer and through spending time with the lord and through spending time in my bible that's right and that is right. absolute and i remember i was driving back and i did not believe you <laughs> I was like, I was like, no way. 
And I remember, I, yeah, I was even so worked up afterwards that I just, I even, and you, uh, another really good one you gave me was you gave me, you told me to sit down and write my goals out. And we even, you even gave me some goals at the time to start working on. And I completely ignored those even on, on the drive home from that. Cause I was up, I was still kind of worked up and upset. And, um, even driving home, I hadn't, I, uh, still went back to my old ways. That's funny. But. <laughs> you're right i did say that i said um at the end of the day i can give you all kinds of good advice about how to handle these different things but if you would pray and you would worship and you would read the scriptures 90 percent of your problems would be taken care of and the reason is not because it's magic it's because you'll make better decisions and you'll have the lord's favor upon your life and then whatever issues remain whatever stops being present, then we can get a little more, um, concentrate can, on con those yeah, issues. We can get a little more concentrated on how to actually handle whatever's left after that. Cause, and again, a lot of those were just between God and I. Right. And, um, absolutely. They took, um, granted, you still gave me that little, the little prodding in the beginning, um, and help get that ball rolling. But at the end of the day, it's still up to whoever it is to yeah. uh, start that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, I do. I do. Just I remember thinking, like, man, I don't think this is gonna work. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it's it's even funny to me to say that out loud at this point. Uh huh. But I do remember. Um, I don't know. We went like you, you, you set me out, and I went about I don't know, like a month, a month and a half before we met up again. And um, I'd already started. I I did come around because it was still very apparent to me that where I was at in life was not working. And I'd talked to a couple other people and gotten some, gotten some pretty worthless advice mm -hmm. from them but yours was the one that still stuck uh, and even going back to um still having that basis of growing up and i think at that point um when you'd put that on my heart uh, like to really come come back and there was still a little bit of a uh, guilt as well mm. as far yeah. as um like well i've already done all of this and yada 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 um how how am i going to go back to a young adults group right was uh, that because that was the one. huh was that what we did next was i just invited you to come to young adults with us or with me? i don't i think there was some in between um i think there were, i think you probably the second time you did maybe you did the first time but i didn't start going yet Okay. But I do remember it still being snowy out in Michigan and driving back, starting to drive back and forth to a young adult. So somewhere in there. Granted, Mi Michigan's winter likes to go all the way into June some years. So. Yeah, true. But it, I, re I remember it still being winter and I was starting to attend young adults. Mm -hmm. But I think it was probably the second time okay. that you really. Somewhere in there. Yeah, so that's so. What you're telling me is you didn't like the advice to start off. You didn't like what I had to say, but it's the only thing that really continued to remain with you after a little while. So you you tried it out. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, I again I, I brought it up to my dad that I'd mentioned that you you'd exist you existed still, and that we'd touched base because he remembered you from a. Uh, Young adults, yep, or youth group, mm -hmm. not young adults, um, and again, you had a you had a good background and all that fun stuff, and again, your advice was the one that still stuck with me. So I did end up starting to do some of the goals, and I I don't remember uh, you told me to read, definitely to read, start prayer, and um, start working my way away from. The drugs <laughs> yeah um 
and obviously none of that happened very quickly either. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like all of a sudden I woke up and I no longer wanted to do any of that. Right. But so I started coming to uh, young adults during that time period, though. And at some point, too, started started phys- started trying to work on my physical health as well. I think that was that was another one that you gave that you helped start me on. That was just really ended up being really beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I ha- wasn't as good on the s- spiritual side, but like the, the physical side of starting to be able to see my, to be able to see changes in my body was really, um, really a good one too. Yep. But so you, you came back, started, started going to young adults and really, you need to get in there and listen to George. I think the very first night, the very first night I came was worship night. And that had been, that was something I'd never experienced before was a worship night at young adults. Mm-hmm. That, that was something that was completely, that completely caught me off guard. Yeah. That usually does. Uh, especially when it's your first time going to a young adults worship night. So, to be clear, like the only thing that's weird about a young adults worship night is that we typically we like to dance. Like that's that's about it. We're worshiping the Lord and we like to jump around and sing our hearts out. Like I don't think it's that weird, but in comparison to what most churches I should say what most of the old traditional churches do, it's a little strange. But it's not like we're doing anything weird or cultish. We just, we just love the Lord so much and love what He's done that we'll, we're willing to dance. We're willing to jump around and, and sing very loudly with our hands raised. It's you know wild stuff, I guess. Oh yeah, but also just the whole energy in the room and just the 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 face. People are smiling. People are happy to be in His presence. Mm-hmm. That's something you don't really see every day either. Yeah. So tell me. That's the first night that you came was a worship night. Tell me about your thought process. You thought it was weird, but like, give me a little more. I did. Um, and to be honest, at the time, my uh, when I first got there, my biggest concern was positioning myself near the door so that I could get out to the bathroom to go vape halfway through. <laughs> That was my that was my biggest concern in the moment, mm-hmm. but then being able to get into there and um, really just again, I'd never seen people so happy to worship the Lord before, mm-hmm. and that really that did stand out to me. And now, granted, there still was a little bit of like, wow, these people are bouncing all over the room. Um. But so that was that really did stand out to me. That's something I hadn't experienced before. And then also Jordan talked for a little bit, but it was I think the second one that I came to, where I got to sit down and listen to Jordan preach. That was really good. Mm-hmm. And I guess we, obviously you understand Jordan, but Jordan does. Jordan is an absolutely amazing creature <laughs> yes he has he has an incredible gift placed on his life absolutely and um he really helped start moving things in in my heart too and helped me to start realizing is he just continued to realize more that needed the change in my life yeah. and really help plant those seeds in my life that I need to change then that there is no other there is no other way that was a good realization too because um to a certain extent too you're able to kind of come to those and feel good for a little bit afterwards they kind of get by and then um go back to your old ways during the week on and off and then um kind of live vicariously through that Right, would be the best way I could put it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I, I did, I did end up doing that for a little bit too, before I fully, fully realized that there is no, there is no halfway with God. Right. 
So let's let's fast forward a little bit to that moment. You have been coming to young adults, you've been getting the the weekly inspiration and it's carrying you through the week, making you feel good, and then you're just like, Man, if I can just get to Thursday, then I'll feel good again, right? Yeah, kind of to a, to an extent, yes. At what point does it shift from I'm going to young adults to uh, to get my weekly inspiration to I really actually love the Lord and I'm not doing this for any other reason than I want to be with him and learn about him. And I guess I am a little bit, I'll say boring to an extent on that too. I didn't really have a big turning point. It was a lot of gradual working towards and realizing, oh, maybe if I start doing the things that I should, my life will start going better. If I start following God like I should, and obviously the the gifts are a byproduct of that. Mm -hmm. It's not the what to strive for, but um, because I I'd, I'd started like trying to get off of start is trying to go cold turkey on stuff and failing, going a little bit, going a little bit of time, and then failing, going back and back and forth, back and forth. Um. That all was kind of a, it was a slow process, but there w wasn't really just like one time where it was like, I'm completely, completely done. Um, it just happened at one point. It had been going longer times, and then there was one where I just never, I just never went back. I never went back to that, to those vices again. Mm -hmm. And... It was a really, it was a really long, painful process, but being able to transition from that and just just key in on um, spending time with the Lord, yeah. Whether and worship too. There was you, you when you started teaching me to uh, worship in my own time was a really good one too. You being able to have something to turn to when you uh, when you want to when you wanted like when I wanted to get high and then being able to have something to turn to there were some times where just like being able to just go to the gym for a bit but would help with that too but really being able to turn to my bible or being able to turn to just prayer not necessarily worship as much that was, but more being able to definitely be able to turn to prayer during that time mm -hmm. really did help with the long run so it was all, there was kind of a gradual period of like probably six, six months or so where it really, at the end of those, I'd really come a long way on my goals. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the phone call. There was one, I don't even remember what day it was, what time, I have no recollection of where it was, but it was like, it was toward the beginning of our, of our relationship. Um, you gave me a call and you told me that you were very sorry. Um, basically just like you had opened up that you had a problem with chronically lying could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, cause there still were, there definitely, even though I'd really opened up to you the uh, first time and I really had gotten the, uh, um, big pieces. I really had relayed a lot of stuff. There was, that was what I really was ashamed of still. Mm -hmm. Because that had been, that had been something I had had in my life for a really long time, even before, um, for any of it that had been there for a long time and I even at the time I didn't feel comfortable with relaying that to you mm -hmm. and um, I'd continued to even like hide that from you and I, <laughs> I remember that accumulating and then I'd gone back to um, 
I'd gone, I'd gone back to what I normally would do when I was stressed. And then I, uh, I still felt that way. I still really felt that on my heart too. I, I couldn't forget it that time. And so I called you mm -hmm. and, uh, let you know, let you know about that. Cause I'd still been covering for myself and, certain spots yeah and that was yeah that was when i like i said i'd really fought with that for a long time and so really it took a while to work through that but that was the first step of that starting yeah see that was a an interesting conversation on my part too because that's when it occurred to me Oh, this is why, I mean, this is not entirely why, but this is partially why he goes to the marijuana, to the nicotine, and to the drinking. It's because he really just doesn't like who he is, in part because of this. And so he goes to these things to forget. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because even, you will have that, um, feeling of guilt or feeling of shame and those each each one of those uh, vices allows you to um remove that for a time mm -hmm. for a time being the uh key factor and then you gotta find something else yeah so and it fundamentally yeah not being not being happy with who I was and not having a and having that affect my life and therefore not not having a life that I considered worth living were really uh, at the heart of it those were some of the big ones that were affecting that and I think one other one that um, I'd brought I'd brought up to you originally that I hadn't at that point I hadn't come to terms with was uh the the passing of my mom yeah i hadn't come to terms to with that at all at that point and that was one that uh i was able to i brought up to you mm -hmm. and this was in our initial initial conversation i remember yeah so that would probably be another pain i was covering for at the time yeah if you don't mind can we talk about that a little bit yeah absolutely Okay. So how old were you when your mother passed? Uh, 13. 13. 13. Okay. So I, and so I'd kind of gotten like those original years, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. the, the fundamentals of what a mother has to impart to you. Right. Um, I at least had gotten that. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's really tough. When you're 13, uh, having to, to trust the Lord to to deal with that, I mean, yeah, and I I didn't I didn't at all. It really it did really hit my family hard during that, and to an ex to an extent, I still I absolutely love my dad, but to an extent, he was was not ready for that, and he kind of shut down during that time for mm -hmm. at least. Um, he was not pre he had been doing work he was not prepared to raise two kids at that point um he didn't he didn't come he didn't turn to um vices but he kind of shut down emotionally during that time and that really did in turn my brother and i both kind of did as well so that never really that that pain never really got resolved it just kind of festered for many years at that point, and that would probably be another another one that I didn't I didn't necessarily touch on before. That was that that pain kind of stayed with me, and that was another one that was being covered that was I was covering at the time. Yeah. How did you deal with that? Now that you're starting to follow the Lord, you're getting away from the things that have previously covered for you. How did the Lord help you 
handle the loss of your mother. Crying out to him and asking asking him in prayer were two really big ones that I hadn't I had never I had never done before. I had never gone to him and asked for peace and on on those pieces of my life. Um and it wasn't granted right away. It was a process of prayer and still to a certain extent even just coming to terms with it um in just within i hadn't even really i just pushed it down i hadn't really thought of it so even just having it come to the surface and being forced to deal with it was a another important one so to an extent um definitely digging into prayer helped a lot with that Mm -hmm. and so it did it did really it, it had affected my life a lot more than I'd realized even too because again I just pushed pushed that down I had never I had never dealt with those emotions with those even this and yeah, you probably even saw it to an extent those raw emotions coming back up when I, that was another, I just couldn't hold it together anymore emotionally mm -hmm. that first time that we talked. That was the first time I'd cried in front of somebody in years, many years. I couldn't, I couldn't hold it together anymore. That was another really big, that, was, that really did help draw me, help me realize too. That was the one, that was, I guess, part of the pivotal point of, having that all start to change too was I couldn't hold it together emotionally anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there uh, anything else uh, wanted to touch on with my mom? Yeah. You know, this is another part that I remember from our initial, our initial talk was you you kind of felt abandoned because both your, both because of your mother's passing and because of the way that your dad handled uh, the whole situation. And I mean, I I remember your dad, <laughs> and he is a really great man. You have a really great father who did a fantastic job considering the circumstance. I mean, you know, he's working and he's homeschooling his two boys. And taking them to church and I mean that's raising two he, sons on your own is a tall order for any man absolutely and like when I say he shut down a little bit it was more so he shut down emotionally he still carried through and led the family mm -hmm. very well even though it was just three guys um, I and I still I get to see how much he influenced my life um i would hate to see where where i would have gone without having a good um earthly father to show me the show me what a what a heavenly father could be mm -hmm. um but yeah at the time um yeah i did really i did really feel feel that still um yeah i did and uh, yeah i did feel Abandoned, uh, pushed away a little bit and abandoned a little bit, which weren't necessarily 100% justified. 100% um, justified uh, emotions to have. Right. I did feel that way, but I did still have a really, at the end of the day, I did still have a really good dad who I love very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were feeling abandoned and. I can imagine that one of the things that the Lord was able to do as you brought this, I mean, usually with the other people that I've spoken to who have had similar circumstances, losing a parent, losing a sibling, you know, they really had to 
struggle with the Lord, but I think that you, at least it sounds like you did a part of the reason that you're in the position you are now is because you were quick to surrender. You were quick to surrender these things to his care and not fight him on it forever. Again, I was just so, I didn't have any energy left to fight at that point. I was just so tired Mm -hmm. is the best way I can put it. Um, I had absolutely realized that there was a massive piece of my life that was missing. And I had, I I just couldn't continue life without it. So being able to pass all, being able to pass those over to the, because to an extent there is, you do have to harden up to the world to a bit. Mm-hmm. Or I shouldn't, I shouldn't say, it. yeah, like that. But there's also, there's so many things that when you carry them yourself and you don't pass them over to the Lord, that those just drag, drag you down. And I hadn't, had not realized that yet. Yep. But you were yeah. able to surrender these things to the Lord. When did your life start to really go up? When did you start to have uh, hope for the future and say, you know, I've, I have turned my life around. Was there a particular point that, that you recognized that was happening? It, yeah. There, there were a couple of, um, couple of key things that, um, helped remind me of that. Um, one would have been the lake swim. Really? It's ironic yeah. that you say that because the lake swim is coming up. <laughs> I, and I'm very, I'm very sad that I'm going to miss it this year. Um, but for all the other, other young men listening to this right now, <laughs> go swim across that lake with Aaron. You're going to get something out of it one way or the other. Oh yes. Um, even if it's just the fear of death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, absolutely. The uh, the fear of death is um, a really good motivator to uh, get you to swim. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is. But you were saying you, the you felt that that was a turning point in your life. That was that was one of them. That was one of them. Um, at least one of the ones I can remember off the top of my head right now because. I remember we got into the other side and sitting there and it was miserably cold and we're waiting for the rest of the uh, rest of you guys to come across. And I remember just thinking like, wow, we just like made it through that. They're, they're so, it seems so terrible for the majority. Like, yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting to the other side and being able to sit there and go, well, I just accomplished that. Mm-hmm. Then there were some other small, I mean, there were other small accomplishments that I made in my life, but that was one that really did stick with me was getting to the other side of that and looking back across and being like, I just accomplished that. Yeah. Another one was when I um, started, I started going to the gym consistently and like, Getting getting a pump on for the first time was a really was one that was like wow I'm actually making progress in this. Um, and like the one of the times you and I had gone running too, mm-hmm. and we completed that full loop all the way around the block. Yep. And got back, and I was like, wow, I kept up with Aaron running. Mm-hmm. That was, but as far as um spiritually too um one of the ones that i really did feel accomplished in was when i was able when i realized that my natural reaction was to go to prayer and not to go to uh not to go to a a substance Mm -hmm. that when when i when i'd actually um realized that i was like wow i am actually making progress in this 
that was a good one too. There were, so again, I didn't really have like one of those really big accumulated like points for like everything, but there were a lot of little moments like that where you start to realize like, wow, I'm actually going somewhere. There's actually stuff changing in my life. There's actually I'm actually going up, mm-hmm. and a lot of even and a lot of the and that was all stepping stones even and that's all stepping stones going forwards when i first getting off getting offered the interview for the position i have now and being able to come through that and say wow i could not have i could not have made it through that where i was at before there's so much that have changed in my life to allow me to be here mm-hmm. so again lots of Lots of little moments, and I would encourage other, I would encourage young men to write those down because I we really do like to forget <laughs> really quickly whenever the, you can start noticing you're making progress, but it's easy to fall back into well, I'm not going anywhere, and pay, whoa, whoa is me. Um, I would encourage. I wish I would have written more of those down. And be able to reflect on, be able to fully realize where I was at at those times mm-hmm. going forwards. Yeah, absolutely. I have I have a journal of my own, and I don't write in it every day. But when there's a big life event, or the Lord has revealed something to me that I didn't know before, and I want to remember it for all time, um, I write it down in that journal. And so I have I actually have two journals now because I've I've totally filled up one. Because I've been writing in it since I was 14. Um, but the other part of being able to go back into that journal is to see... It's it's fascinating how just reading you know two pages of I met this girl and had this interaction or this is something that I just learned about at church or something. It's interesting how it takes you back to that moment and you read and you... Like you remember all the details and then you can say, ah, I didn't see it at the time, but this is where the Lord was. This is what the Lord was doing at the time that this was going on in my life. I actually just recently, a couple weeks ago, like sat down for two hours with the Lord and I didn't pray or anything. I just read through this journal, reading through all of the weird things that I was thinking about. And that were going on in my life when I was 16 and 17. Thinking, wow, you were there. I didn't see it, but you were there. And I recognize that now. That's a beautiful thing to be able to do. So yes, yes, get a journal and write in it. Absolutely, absolutely agreed. I would encourage writing those writing those moments down. Because I didn't, but sometimes I will find something that reminds me or a note that I put somewhere or um, even I found an old notepad that reminded me of something that really put a smile on my face and was like, wow, <laughs> that's what, that was what was happening in my life that day. Mm-hmm. So I would, I'd absolutely encourage to uh, write those down so you can sit and reflect upon those. good it's good for uh, making progress Mm -hmm. you know for my for my end of all of these things that are going on in your life mentoring somebody isn't a one-way street you learn things from them also so you know one of the things that i learned from you was oh sometimes when people are taking these substances they're not doing it to feel good they're doing it to forget about their lives they're doing it to forget about the things they don't like about themselves. Uh, and one of the other things that you taught me was you just kind of like gave this to me as a passing remark was you you really starting to beat, uh, I think you totally beaten marijuana and you were starting to do better on the nicotine side. You had gone maybe two or three weeks without it. And you said to me, I, this was like right after we did a long run or something to that effect. And you said to me, I didn't know, 
I'm trying to relearn how to have fun sober. And so it's, that taught me, ah, it's important to, to have fun. And it's important to have fun with, especially with people that you're mentoring who have gone through doing the drugs or, you know, they can't go to a, previously they couldn't go to an event and have fun without alcohol or something. It's important to teach them how to have fun without substances, how to have fun sober. 100%. That's a, it's a really good, it's a really good one. I'm glad you brought that up because, um, I remember even there was times where I was able to be off of that and I was just, I was kind of miserable in my own time and I would still try to completely turn to God, but, um, also just having a constructive way to have fun still. Mm -hmm. And you really did help teach me that you taught me the joy of working out and the joy of even, even just when sometimes where you'd invite me into your home for five or like, 10 15 or 10 it's, it's not for a really long time but maybe 30 minutes at most in the more yeah when you'd invite me in the morning i could see um you and your wife mm -hmm. spending time together and the joy that you guys had absolutely that absolutely um just seeing those little those little blips and then um in times where we just go out and do something fun as a group in a constructive manner, mm -hmm. those those are all <laughs> really really important and good memories to me. Yeah, that is yeah, that is funny because I don't I don't even remember uh, I don't remember saying that. What was the other one? Uh, the two the two you? big things that I can recall that you said to me were you no know, figuring out how to have fun sober, but also when you gave me the call about you were opening up to me about how you had for most of your teenage years, let's say been a chronic liar. Um, it might've been something that you said, but I think that was more a revelation from the Holy spirit that you were going to substances, not because it made you feel good, but because you were, you didn't like the life that you had. So you were, going to these things to forget to forget that yeah. you didn't like who you were yeah to not even necessarily go up to just feel normal or just to feel okay mm -hmm. uh, there were still times where like yeah we'd party and those those were involved more heavily than normal but a lot of times it was just smaller dosages just to get through the day right and i would say that's almost most of what I would say nicotine is, it just makes you feel okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that for, and again, this is my experience, so I can only speak to that. And then marijuana being more of a relax, like, yeah, being a heavier version of that for me. Right. I wasn't really doing it to party all the time. I was doing it to feel normal. Mm-hmm. And that was another one was um, when I was first really starting because I'd spent like there was almost a solid year in that time period where I'd just been stoned. And um, it was weird. I was realizing I was going into gas stations and stuff and I felt weird being sober inside of a gas station. <laughs> <laughs> I just I felt I would feel weird being sober in public. Because that was another I had never dealt with like a uh, social anxiety or anything. I'd been awkward, but I was uh, maybe so oblivious to it at the time that it didn't even phase me um, when I'd been younger. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, coming off of it, I was getting really anxious being in being in public and like just going being able to because I would always like do that before going into public spaces quite often not to not to the point of being completely uh faded but just enough to feel feel a bit more relaxed mm -hmm. yeah 
Dude, that was a, yeah, that was an iron trust one because I remember going in the gas stations and just feeling like, wow, this is like <laughs> what a gas station looks like normally. <laughs> I mean, it's not good, but it's super funny to me. <laughs> well, and... it's I mean, it's a little bit funny, but that's true. You know, I've I've listened to a lot of podcasts about dudes who've come out of addiction, and they're like. It's weird to do things without being high or drunk all the time. Like, and that's crazy. It is. When it makes it harder when you're coming off of it, when you're um, when you're trying to transition back to normal normalness, mm-hmm. um, it really does make it more apparent to you at the time that you're not. Um, oh, I guess one other one that I wish. I'd stuck with because there was a really there was a extended period of time where I was trying to I was trying to quit nicotine I was trying to quit nicotine, and I kept just going back and forth back and forth. I'd make it like three days or four or five days or a week or two weeks or th- um some probably not longer than that probably in, somewhere between the one and one day and two weeks, and um. I absolutely would have saved myself so much pain if I would have just uh, gotten that down in a much shorter... Because I did that for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so really starting to realize how... Um, also, being older a little bit and looking back, um, I really want to encourage some of the guys out there that, like, um, as you as you continue to get older, you start to realize that time... Six months. When you look back, and it's you, you can look back six months, it doesn't really feel like that much. And particularly if you just stick it through for that period of time, and then you're going to be able to just continue. I know it, is, it still sounds a lot. It's a lot easier said than done. Um, but you start to realize just how like fickle time is. Some in in certain instances. Yeah, that's true. I uh, I say this often as a joke, but I'm pretty sure that yesterday I was 18, and today I'm 22, and I'm married. <laughs> time, time yeah. the older you get and the more responsibility you get, time does seem to go faster. Absolutely. And, like, it makes it easier to, come, to get through that stuff. Absolutely. Just this, just a soldier it through for that little bit where it sucks, and then it just, it just gets, it gets on, it continues to get much more of an even keel as you continue forwards. Yeah. But yeah, that joke absolutely holds true. It's absolutely crazy to think about. I'm going to be 21 in a very short period of time. Yeah. And it feels like I was just moving out of my dad's house a year ago, at most. Mm-hmm. Very much so. So, one of the things I want to talk to you too, <clears throat> talk to you about too, is uh, you beat nicotine, you beat alcohol, you beat marijuana, you also beat pornography, uh, and I'm yes. curious to know how you did that. Yeah, I guess we haven't even touched on that. Yeah, um, I haven't even touched it. So, how did you beat porn? Absolutely. Then I remember in the beginning, um, it had been like so. I'll say infested in my mind that I would end up realizing that I'm just, I wouldn't be feeling it, but I'd still end up just be thinking about it or even, um, so the, that one's a bit more straightforward. Yes, there absolutely is an emotional, um, emotional tie to it that you build up. But that hadn't been something I'd like really, it hadn't been like one of the really big issues for me. I hadn't really, because I, I do, I've, have to, I've talked to some people that really, really had dug into it. Mm-hmm. That was really, that was their vice. Um, I was more of your average, your average user. Um, so the big ones for me was just to absolutely avoid it at all costs. Continue going, um, just absolutely avoiding it. I'm not allowing that into my life in any, any capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And obviously, it's still a lot easier said than done. Um, but also, like, it's easy to just kind of bargain. It, that's another one that's easy, kind of to bargain with yourself. And um, I didn't realize that it was really a problem either. You'd uh, you'd told me told me that wasn't like the that that's not something that you want. In your, that's not something that a godly man has in his life. And I was like. Mm. Press I hadn't really doubt. Yeah, I hadn't really <laughs> taken that to heart at all, at all. Um. So when I finally did it, 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 it again, it took realizing that, like, wow, this is affecting my life. This is not godly in any fashion. This is not what. Um. This is not what a relationship should look like, or um, because that. It absolutely affected my relationship far more than it should have. Your relationship all, meaning your relationship with God or your relationship with girls? Relationship with women. Mm. Obviously, it still did affect my relationship with God. Um, but that was another one that directly... Because um, I, I, I relate to you. Like I had, lo I had lost my virginity when I was younger and i would say that would that helped influence and then even with i started looking for that um started wanting i mean and obviously plenty of young men do but right. that um started wanting that out of my relationship with my at at the time godly girlfriend that did not did it did not was not going to tolerate that mm -hmm. um so that did end up affecting that relationship. Um, so it did take me coming to terms with, yes, this is something that has no place in my life. And once I'd come to that realization fully, um, completely removing it and was, it was still a process. There was still time where I'd go back to it, but that one was relatively kind of quick that I was able to just go, Oh, it's already it's been two months. This isn't going to be a problem for me any longer. Hmm. As, so as far as... But again, I wasn't really that engrossed in it compared to some. Right. So you basically were just like... You said, this isn't my primary vice, so I just have to, you know, put on the... Uh, the censoring on my Google Chrome and whenever I get the urge to, to go view pornography, I just have to like go to the gym or pray or, or talk my way out of it, basically. E yep. And it, well, and to an extent, obviously there is the uh, action that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. Um. So I still did continue that just without viewing anything for a bit. And then just even later on in life, being able to mitigate, get, remove both, but absolutely getting rid of porn made um, getting rid of the other easier. Yeah, absolutely it does. But absolutely. Um, so in the beginning, kind of still physically because it, it's meant it's a it's a mental game as well so still physically relieving that for a time but then um just not viewing it in any fat uh, any facet mm -hmm. just absolutely just getting rid of that yeah so this is actually i don't think i've had any, this conversation with anybody else how do you do without the how do you how do you get rid of masturbation that's been a really really tough one <laughs> um to an it's it's a really it's been a really long process and even at this point I wouldn't say I'm 100%. It's been a, it's been a good um probably month and month and 3 weeks or something. Yeah. So I'd say I'm pretty well 
well on my way, but um, there were some physical things with it that made it difficult in the beginning, like having my body adjust to uh, not doing that all the time and still uh, having having wet dreams was something. <laughs> that is something else. Yeah. Uh, I was pretty sure at one point that like I, I was going to get up and my brain, blanket was going to crack in half. <laughs> I had to let... <laughs> I did have to add that to my uh, laundry. But um, that that was pretty quickly. That only happened a few times. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I'd space stuff out. So... In the beginning, it was honestly a lot of just just going longer periods, um, and then the, you'd still have like those thoughts, and to an extent too. Even like obviously, we're all aware of um, where most of our gym, where where how most women dress at the gym. True. So there there were definitely were times where um, yeah, absolutely. I just did not go to the gym during busy times. It was not a not a good thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, so, remove, but also just going longer periods of time, and I'll switch like just praying as well. But another one, one thing that really did mean something. Really, and that's currently really meant a lot to me. And also, I've met. I've been dating now and having the thought that the next time I do that, it's going to mean something. It's going to be with my wife. Yeah. That absolutely um, meant a tre tremendous amount to me. Mm -hmm. And um, by next time, you mean like the next time that you have an orgasm, it will be with your wife. That's yeah. what's got it. Absolutely. That, that's something I get to share. It's not like... Because there is a certain amount of shame that goes along with that too. Of course. When you're in your own time. And it's not what you should be doing. It's not... You're, you're wasting that gift. Um, so having that full realization that next time is going to be with my wife mm. whether that's been the really that's been a just a really good thought to that when when that when i start having that urge i remember that yeah that that's been a really yeah that's been a good one for me yeah. that's made it easier this this goes back to again our initial conversation getting writing down some of the goals some of the things that you want with your life this is a big one where you you have to recognize pornography and even uh, masturbation, these things will affect your ability to have an intimate, wonderful, exclusive relationship with your wife. Yes. And so having a vision for your life, I've said it before, having a vision for your life is key to breaking some of these addictions. Because if you're just fighting it because it's the right thing to do, it's not motivating. But saying, yeah, so that I'm, I'm sabotaging my own life when I do this. I'm sabotaging the future that I could have with a wonderful woman and my children. That's something else you were saying. Yeah. Yes. But no, that point right there. When you truly realize the gravity of it. Because like... Yes, and that's where you can sit and bargain with yourself. Well, well, I'm sitting here foregoing all of this, and woe is me. I don't, I don't feel good at the moment. I need, I need, I need dopamine now. <laughs> um, yeah, realizing that, like, no, there is, there's absolutely so much at play. Um, it, your entire, your entire well-being is in the, in the, in the rungs right now, mm -hmm. and you're fighting for it. This isn't just horseplay. This is literally your life, and that you're the, you're the only one that's going to. And that was that's another really good one that I had to come to terms with. 
was uh, kind of living vicari- vicariously through people to an extent mm-hmm. or um having the almost trying to have them babysit you into doing the right thing right um yeah that doesn't work you have to realize that you are absolutely and god's there and when i say you you're the only one that's going to physically make that choice if you don't if you aren't willing to listen to god either to obviously god's creator universe capable of anything but he's not going to Inter- generally he's not going to interfere with that you're still you still have free will mm-hmm. or you that, yeah you have free will it's your choice and that's still easy to say but truly coming to terms with that takes a little bit of time yep the Lord will be with you the Lord will give you strength but my analogy when it comes to things like this is God promised the Israelites the promised land that he was going to put it into their hands. And there were multiple times that the Israelites, once they had the promised land, they had to defend it against enemy nations that wanted to come and conquer it and take it away. And often all the time it says in the Bible, especially when these enemy armies that were coming, when these enemy armies would come and the, whoever the king was at the time followed the Lord, they would inquire of the Lord and whoever was the prophet at the time would say, the Lord will fight your battle. Whether it was them going up into the promised land to claim it or whether they were defending it, the Lord will fight your battle. But guess what? The Israelites still had to strap on their armor and they still had to march and they still had to blow the trumpets. They still had to form the battle lines. They still had to make the plans and the strategies. They still had to charge the field and swing the swords. They still had to collect the booty once all of their enemies had been defeated. They still had to collect the treasure and carry it back. There's still physical work that has to be done but the Lord will give you strength and you will win victories that you had would never have been able to accomplish by your own power. Yeah. Cause even if you were capable of doing the physical, he's taking care of the spiritual. Yes. Even if they're, yeah, that's yeah. Very much so. So even if you were like, yeah, trying to physically do it correctly and you were physically doing it correctly coming back with uh, coming back with God mm-hmm. and I'm glad that you bring this up because you know there was a period of time you got the job the job that you're at now this apprenticeship uh, and you had to go to another state a state where none of your family lived and you were living by yourself and so the fact that you have still, beaten all of these things in spite of the fact that you were taken out of the place that you dug roots, the place that was spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, uh, watering you and feeding you, you got pulled up and planted somewhere else, pulled up and moved somewhere else, and you still are winning. Yeah, and I, I remember that really was a matter of concern for me. Um, and I think I'd brought that up to you that I really was nervous and, um, and at the time I even thought I was coming back. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't fully realized that what the position had actually entailed until I'd gotten there. And then I'd kind of got there and was like, oh yeah, yeah, you, you're not going to be going back to Michigan to live if you uh, continue with this. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a little moment of like, oh snap. <laughs> um, but you'd, you really had imparted to me the fact that God's everywhere. God is not just in Mount Hope. Yeah. I can't just go to Mount Hope my entire life mm-hmm. and uh, have that be the only place that I find God. Yeah. Um, and having your, your influence 
virtually did still matter a lot, but you'd given me all of the tools at that point. You'd given me enough of a, f- or and I say you, I say that loosely. Um, I, I'd been given enough um, foundation that I didn't just completely fall apart when I was when I was set out on my own again to an extent because I was back to I was back to where that all that could have come back into my life. Absolutely, it could have. And even had plenty of opportunity for it too. Mm-hmm. So being able to not fall right back into that was like that was another point where I really did realize like wow, I've actually I've actually come somewhere. I've actually made progress. I, I, I'd realized I'd made progress at that point, but I was like wow, I really have made a lot of progress now. Yes, that this isn't. And it's still underlying. Obviously, there's still plenty of times that I want to... Uh, I shouldn't say it like that. There's still times where like, I'll see someone using some form of nicotine and there's a piece of me that wants to go back to it. But I realize the life I have now and there's like, there's no way I could. Mm-hmm. That is not what God has called me. That's not what God wants for me. Yeah, That's not what I want for me. Yeah. And we've talked about this. We've said you may have to deal with those temptations your whole life. But guess what? If you live your life for the Lord, if you are taking your life and being movable, following him and building a a life that you would be unashamed to present to Jesus at the end of all time, your life will be like a vapor. I mean, you're going to blink and you're going to be on your deathbed. So uh, absolutely and that's that's not a a bad thing when you're following the lord that's not a bad thing because it means that your temptations will not last forever one it is it is interesting too because it means cutting out a lot in the meantime mm-hmm. my uh my girlfriend just experienced that to an extent where she had to um cut some people out of her life because they were not having a godly way and it's she st- even stood up for being a Christian mm-hmm. and was able to relay that at the time yeah and something she said afterwards when she was talking to me because she was a little bit upset that she had to do that but um that when she came before God that his name she she had spoke his name in that time Mm -hmm. that's that really that that was meant a lot to me yeah that's building with silver and gold paul talks about this in uh in i want to say first corinthians i just read this verse too it's ridiculous i can't remember but first corinthians or second corinthians paul says on judgment day all of the believers will present their lives jesus will be the foundation and upon it, people will build with gold and silver, precious stones, uh, wood and hay. And it will pass through fire. And some will suffer loss. They'll still be saved, but they'll suffer loss because they didn't build with gold and silver. And that's building with gold and silver. That's building with something that will last into eternity. Absolutely. And just keeping that in mind on a day-to-day basis... Even having to remind yourself of that, but just having that there, that just how temporary this life is yes. sometimes, or just how it is sometimes, just how temporary this life truly is. And that that was almost what I was calling, uh, what I was trying to get at with, um, when you're trying to get off of this stuff, just remember, just try to remember how temporary those physical withdrawals are. And when you get to the other side, when you've gone six months, you don't even look back. There's still that tiny little twinge when you do see somebody, but it's so much easier to forego. Mm-hmm. It's a twinge, not a slap upside the head. Right. <laughs> right. So being, again, having that perspective on time as well is really important in, in, living and living a godly life and even getting off of those substances just 
I would say that those, it applies very well to both of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but all of this to say, like, mo getting pulled up out of the place that you had really start to, started to grow in, moving somewhere else, being in a position where you could have gone back and destroyed everything that you built, but you didn't, and you've gotten better, that is a that is a testament to the Lord's work in your life and to your own faithfulness and your own the own increasing strength of your life and that's not something to uh, you know that's not something to be like I'm so much better but that is something to to take some form of pride in yeah to be able to, well yeah absolutely be able to take pride in your own life but mm -hmm with it being humble in that because yes. when you're trying to explain to somebody too that doesn't have doesn't have any of that it's really easy for them to concentrate on the stuff the stuff you have mm -hmm. or the relationships that you have or and really just trying to harp on the fact that this is all a byproduct this is this is not all this stuff is just byproducts of having a life for Christ. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> just as he says in Matthew, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added to you. You have sought first the kingdom and these things are being added to you. And it is Absolutely. It is beautiful to see, and it is inspiring to me. And it also makes life a lot more enjoyable. True, true. Life is full of joy and, and peace when you do so. And when, yeah, that was another big one was the, the really realizing the difference between joy and happiness. Having joy from the Lord is something. I'm going to be able to wake up and this is this is my life and I get to glorify God today. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Peter, Indeed. what do you think rather what is something that you wish young men would learn? The yeah. couple couple of things, couple of things. Um I had no idea the uh benefits of being of going to the gym i'll harp on that one um get in the gym and move some weights mm. that's been a big one to be able to see progress and i don't allow that to consume you in any fashion um and no steroids i know but you don't get to use steroids <laughs> um <laughs> But absolutely, get in there. Go to the gym. It builds discipline. It builds character. Um, that would be one I wish I realized because it does affect areas of your life and it does make dating a little bit easier. True. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't have that be your primary factor, but it, it does. Um, so absolutely. To take care of your physical health, eat well, Go to the gym. Those were two really big ones um, that I would say pass on, pass on. I personally wish that I had kept a journal or kept some, even not even a journal to an extent. Um, but like m what you'd mentioned, Aaron, with like writing down those highlights. You don't have to like write down every single day, but like having those times where it's like, wow, God really worked in my life today. And being able to go back and reflect on that and saying, like, wow, this is where I was at. This is where God was working in my life. Um, I would highly encourage that. Um, trying to and just continuing to realize, like, how much better life can get. Mm. I would say that those are the good one, big ones glory peter the reason i wanted to have you on today i might have already mentioned it at the very beginning i don't remember it's been an hour and a half uh, but the reason that i wanted to have you on is to show 
a point A to point B story that I have gotten to see with my own eyes. Um, you've matured in a really short amount of time into a man that I would trust with my wife, my money, my health. Um, and one of the most important parts of that transformation is that you have become a self-feeder. You have become a man in that you feed yourself physically, you feed yourself spiritually, because nobody has to look over your shoulder to make sure that you're eating right, that you're going to the gym. Nobody has to look over your shoulder to make sure that you're managing your finances well, or that you are reading and praying and worshiping. Nobody is looking over your shoulder. And that's exactly the kind of man that you, that everyone should strive to be. And exactly the kind of man that I want to help everyone that I mentor become. A self-feeding man. Not self-sufficient in that I don't need God. Because we all need God. There's no, there's no way around that. We all need the blood of Jesus upon our life. But you don't need me to lead you by the hand anymore. And that is why I'm yes. so proud of you. And why I'm so pleased to be able to present you to the entire internet. <laughs> so, guys, this is... You've just gotten to hear firsthand uh, the life of a man who has lived relentlessly. A man who has lived out the relentless life and continues to live it out. Be like Peter. Be like Peter. And you will find that your life will become so much sweeter, just as he's also discovered. So guys, Peter, do you have any uh, uh, passing final thoughts i should say no i i think we uh pretty much touched on everything so it'd be a pretty good pretty good wrapping up point you heard it from the man himself folks we have touched everything all right do you have any social media or anything that you want to shout out in case somebody wants to contact you and you know get more details from you personally um yeah, that'd be one other one. Get rid of all social media. It's <laughs> terrible. Um, no, no, no. No, this is for you to... Contact know, information. Contact information. <laughs> um, if you can, you can reach out. I have my phone number is 252-903-8398. But that was one other one. Is I got rid of all social media, and I'm never looking back. Glory to God. You know, that's that's a funny part of these is like... <laughs> I keep wanting to be like, give me your give me your social media so I can shout you out and people can contact you. And everybody that I've talked to is like, I don't got social media. <laughs> so it's like, no, you can but, only I mean, find these. Does... You can only find these men in church. Okay, you can only find these men in church, and you can only find good women in church. All the yes. all the good ones can only be found there. Absolutely. They're, they are nowhere else to be found. You can't find them on Instagram. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Glory. But yeah, absolutely. Good deal. And if you honestly, um, if someone does, that number's out there. You're welcome to reach out and, or, and get a hold of Aaron too. Either way. Yep. I've got my email posted on the web, um, on the YouTube channel. You can find me at Relentless Living ministry on instagram i am the only christian man on instagram okay so i'm the only one that you can find <laughs> so yeah go live relentless go get rid of yeah. the terrible things in your life go to the gym get a girlfriend from church and uh just, just get get better scrub get better scrubs <laughs> get better and we'll be three. here to help you out along the way because we love you. No homo. <laughs> no homo.
We love you guys. Bye.